Hi, everybody. This is Scott McLeod with another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. I'm here today with Mark Hardiman and Blair Peterson. They are the director and the principal of the secondary school at the International School of Tanganyika in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Um, IST, as it's affectionately known. <laughs> um, Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit about IST? Who, what kind of students do you serve and families? What's your learning model there? Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, IST is actually one of the second oldest international school in out on the continent of Africa. Uh, we started in 1963 um, and have served uh, thousands and thousands of students since that time. Uh, we've always been a very diverse community. We have a, lo a lot of local uh, business people and entrepreneurs, uh, long-term residents of, of Dar es Salaam, as well as uh, many embassies are located currently in, in Dar es Salaam and NGO organizations that serve uh, the community here in Tanzania. Uh, we, we are a two campus school, so we have an elementary campus of about 410 students this year and a secondary campus of about 430 students, they're, and they're located uh, about 10 minutes apart uh, on, in uh, two suburbs of, of Dar es Salaam, uh, and, we, and we're a full IB school. We've been running the PYP, MYP, and DP programs for many years, and um, we feel that's a really effective framework for uh, serving our students, especially the diverse population that we have uh, here in Tanzania. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. So let's just jump right in. So the pandemic hit, what were sort of initial reactions there by IST? What did your transition look like? And most importantly, how do you transfer the IB model to remote? What does that look like? Yeah, we we were, I think, a little bit lucky. Uh, I'll start from the the whole school perspective in, in that the, the pandemic hit Africa a little bit later, at least the initial cases. Um, so we actually um, had a break in early March and, when, and, we, and during that break, we had quite a few members of our community traveling around the world. And when, when they started returning, uh, they were returning from a lot of hot spots that were popping up in, in Europe. Um, and that really brought a front and center into our community and we started looking at what we needed to do to make sure we had a safe environment on campus. Um, and we really uh, had been looking a little bit at some of the models that were coming out of Asia uh, as they closed schools and moved to distance learning. Uh, but we spent an incredible amount of time that, that week after the holiday, uh, making sure that we had some programs in place. Uh, we made the decision to close our campus uh, on a Monday and uh, the board here granted us two days of PD to really uh, embed and, and train our, our, uh, our faculty uh, and try to help us with the transition to our distance learning uh, portal. Um, and, and a lot of that was just consolidating some of the tools that we were using in our day-to-day -day experiences anyway. Um, but the principals uh, took the lead working with their teams on both secondary and elementary uh, to develop a schedule, uh, to, to think a little bit about how we wanted to offer uh, those opportunities to our students. And, and one of the biggest challenges we had was uh, how do we serve students that would be in Tanzania, but also students that had would leave the country and, and be around the world. So uh, a lot of the discussions around synchronous and asynchronous experiences were some of the things that we really had to overcome. Uh, and I'll let Blair talk a little bit more about specifics in the secondary school. Yeah, I think one of the benefits we had was we had really good curriculum in place, mm -hmm. our, our units set with our um, MYP units and also the DP units, and so that really helped us. Uh, we made a decision early on to um, build a schedule that had two big blocks in the morning for classes to meet or teachers to be available during those times and then check-ins with other classes in the afternoon so the kids weren't programmed you know hourly blocks throughout the um, the, the day uh, and then we had Wednesdays which were free for what we call extended homeroom or social emotional activities check-ins with teachers or um, contact with small groups. And we got really great feedback from teachers and students on that. The parents weren't quite convinced it was worthwhile, but I think it did really help with uh, some of our social emotional uh, well-being. And it did give teachers and students time to infrequently or informally check in and work with each other. Uh, but we, we stuck to our units. We had to, you know, pare down, but we, in most cases, continued with our same assessments. Uh, and some, we had to really revamp them based on, you know, the curriculum and what was we were asking of students in those conditions. But we've, we've carried through as best we could. 
<laughs> so Blair, a couple of logistical questions. So you have these couple of sort of fixed blocks in the mornings, Monday, yeah. Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. What does that look yeah. like when students are uh, far flung across the world and in different time zones? Well, so we, we, we had to really think about this asynchronous and synchronous. And what we, as a school, about 70% of our students and teachers were in Dar es Salaam. So we had a good, huge chunk. And we decided we were going to stick to the Dar schedule right as our as our base so we spent a lot of time on asynchronous uh, resources for for students and, and teachers to share so we were trying to provide really clear information in our uh, our learning management system but also screencasts for kids to work through and then check-ins for teachers and students uh, i think as time went on, we realized that we needed touch points for those kids in primarily North America. That was the most difficult one for us to work with because Europe was two, three hours difference and it wasn't as big a deal. But North America was tough. And so uh, we had some teachers and team leaders, you know, checking in with kids during those other time zones. Um, but it, it was tough for those kids uh, who were seven, eight, nine hours away uh, and then we later in the year we tried to schedule some later events for kids to come to so they could be synchronous uh, and and that that helped as well uh, right but we, we really put a focus on the asynchronous product that teachers were putting out so that kids would have access to that at any time got it so was the foundational learning experience the live one or the asynchronous one and if it was the live one did you all like record that and then make it a, so that students could access later how'd you all handle that at both elementary and secondary well i think in the secondary like we looked at both as really valuable and um depending on what was going on uh we didn't initially our position was not to record zoom sessions but um about midway through or so we we changed that so we did record those and, and share those um with, with students um but we you know it depended on the class too because some like the design tech was really perfect for asynchronous because it was learning skills and taking them through a, the, the product developing a product and whatever, like a YouTube DIY type thing. Uh, so asynchronous really worked well for them with check-ins, but in other classes, the, the check-ins were more important and, and time in class or synchronous sessions were really important. Some kids unfortunately got up in the middle of the night, some of our older kids to be there uh, and others uh, did the best they could for checking in. Got it. So, you know, here in the States, we're trying to figure out what our schedule is going to look like uh, in the fall. And right now, a lot of schools are looking at sort of a schedule where you might have a A Monday, B Tuesday with half the kids at each, and then a Wednesday break, and then a Thursday, Friday, A, B again. So this Wednesday break in the middle is really intriguing. The schools here are going to use it for cleaning the facilities um, and sanitizing before kids come back later in the week. So what kind of things did you all do during that middle day and who planned those activities and what did the teachers who, you know, who weren't involved, what were they doing during that day? Uh, yeah, so what we did was uh, we have this uh, homeroom program and on Wednesdays we typically have extended homerooms like an hour and the team leaders, who are grade level team leaders organized with advisors to plan something. And so the, the team leaders did a lot of work around organizing those particular events. Um, and those, those would change as the year went on. They'd go to later times for, so kids, more kids could be involved. Uh, but individual teachers would take time. So they'd say, well, I, I need to work with these particular groups on Wednesday. And so they'd schedule for those groups to, to be online uh, to meet or, um, you know, I think our counselors, our, our counselors would, would set up meetings with, with kids uh, or groups during that time. Uh, and also we had faculty meetings or department meetings during those, those days as well. Got it. Cool. So, Mark, let's circle back around to you. You have the overview of the whole school and then Blair, you can chime in too. So, 
you know, what were some of the most exciting learning experiences that you saw happen over the last couple of months, even though, you know, we had this weird distance learning setup? I think from my perspective, um, we, we talked a lot about the ATL skills and, and some of those, you know, traditional soft skills that uh, sometimes are, are more difficult in a really, um, where the teacher has a lot of ownership over a classroom. Uh, and in the distance learning model, the students had a lot of autonomy. Uh, in, our, in our elementary program, for instance, we ran more uh, a weekly menu uh, and where we would be giving kids uh, work over, over the period of, of a day or, or a week. Uh, and there was a, some choice and opportunity for kids to explore our units of inquiry in the PYP, for instance, over a period of time, present their products uh, and uh, uh, to different groups uh, through Zoom sessions with parents or with other community members. And so, I think it really, sorry. Sorry, Mark, so let's pause right there. So a lot of folks won't know what ATL is. And if you could describe a little bit about what an inquiry unit looks like in IB, that would be helpful too. Well, it's, the ATLs are our approaches to learning. So it's some of the, the uh, skills that we're hoping that uh, we can embed within all of our programs. Um, and uh, what we saw was that our students really showed a, a lot of responsibility for their learning because uh, it, instead of being in a classroom where our students were had such easy access to teachers or one another, um, they had to, to organize their time and thinking around how they could utilize their time between Zooms to accomplish tasks that have been set for them. Uh, and then they would come proactively with information that they needed for their teachers when they were circling through our feedback loops through the distance learning program. Um, our units of inquiry are, are structured through, through the PYP uh, program. Uh, and basically those are explorations uh, that students to, uh, need to go through. And usually, uh, you know, it, it's very, I guess, much like a project-based learning uh, unit. Um, and often they're identifying a task or an area they would like to explore. They're doing research, they're building um, uh, uh, an artifact or an exhibit that they can share with the community. Uh, and I think the distance learning model really helped well with that. We, we were able to have our, our fifth grade final X project. That's what, what uh, is the kind of the culminating aspect of the PYP program. Our students work on that over the whole end of the school year in elementary school. And they were able to, uh, to exhibit that through a presentation where the community came into Zoom sessions and, and it was organized so that each child has a, ch a chance to present their learning to the community. And I know that happened throughout the grade levels as uh, students were able to explore areas that they might have been passionate about and then present that information in a way that uh, gave them a, a bit more on ownership and autonomy than we might traditionally see. Got it, cool. Well, and it strikes me that uh, a learning model that's already focused a lot on learner autonomy and learner agency is gonna transition really well to a, to a time when learners are at home and, and by necessity have to direct their own learning, right? So right. that's pretty awesome. Blair, what does that look like as we move into secondary? So does that sort of student agency and ownership of learning persist? What does, you know? Well, I think in, in many, in all, in all cases, the teachers had to really uh, think about some form of redesign of what, obviously what they were doing, but also, you know, what was expected for kids to learn and know and be able to do. And I think in, in many cases that the teachers did provide more choice for the students in terms of the work they were doing. Obviously the kids had choice in terms of how they organized their work. And, um, and then, you know, in projects, uh, you know, what, what, what direction they took for the specific project. And so that was exciting and it really forced, I think the, the teachers going through that process was really beneficial and is gonna help us in, in the long, long term. I think another thing that I'm really excited about is we set up support structures for those kids who really struggled with it. And we talked about them being disengaged uh, kids and for whatever reason. And our team of team leader and counselor and administrators and teachers were reaching out to them, reaching out to their parents, uh, trying to figure out how do we get them back on board or how we keep them on board. and. I, I just think uh, they did some amazing work with so many kids over 12 weeks. Um, so I think that was that was really excited. One last thing is um, it, it forced us to look at things, you know, doing things differently, like our International Baccalaureate uh, Visual Arts uh, 
exhibition was in um, Minecraft. They did a Minecraft uh, virtual museum. Our graduation, which was virtual, we did 20 days of events to celebrate the class of 2020. Uh, we had Jane Goodall speak to the class on video. And so uh, we pulled in other alumni and things. So we had, we wanted that not to be one big event, but over 20 days of celebration for the class. So it forced us to rethink uh, how we were doing things. And there's many, many examples of that I can think of. Cool. So we're kind of getting close to the end of our time here. I got a couple final questions I want to throw at you. The first one is, as a leadership team, what are some decisions you all made that you think have worked really well during this time? I, I, I think the first one is the schedule. I, I think we, we kept in evolving our schedule. It changed significantly throughout the, the 12 weeks that we were dis, doing distance learning. But I think that the fact that we maintained some structure and we definitely ended the year with, with more structure, but we didn't sacrifice the, the opportunity for flexibility. Um, we, it, it wasn't every minute of every day scheduled for students. It really was about opportunities to have dedicated check-in times, delivery times, and students to explore and come back with questions. And thinking about these things as loops of learning. And I, I think that we ended uh, the year um, really uh, with a solid structure that allowed for both flexibility as well as enough structure to support students well. I think, I think one of the, we there's a lot of good things that I think we did, but one was these uh, connections with the community. And so, like we really, we really focus more on how we can connect more with students, how we can connect more as a faculty and then with parents. And so in both elementary and secondary, we had weekly parent coffees and we had 50, 60 parents on those uh, events each week. And we, you know, it was really, there were different topics and things worked really well, but the parents really, really appreciate it and their level of engagement was high. And by the end of the year, I mean, like we all felt like we'd gone through this journey together. Uh, and it was in the secondary, we had so many parents uh, showing appreciation for, for what we were doing and how we stayed connected. And so I think that was one really big decision we made because we didn't usually meet with parents weekly, right? Right, yeah, I love it. Okay, so then my last question for you is, so you probably have some new practices and skill sets that have emerged during this time. What do you want to hang on to uh, as you think about the next school year? What do you hope keeps happening that didn't happen before? I, I think that the, the learning for, for all, all of our community members was so much more visible. Um, you know, parents were part of the learning experience. Students were definitely advocates and, and agents in their own learning and, and teachers. In order to, to deliver experiences, they had to be able to communicate much more actively with different group, groups over the course of the 12 weeks. And I think the, the more that we can make our experiences visible and include uh, community members in those experiences, I think that that's something that we could bring back to the, the on-campus instruction and, and try and support through uh, a continued partnership to support our students. I think one thing for us as we look to next year, which we'll, we're likely in some type of on-site hybrid model with restrictions for the COVID crisis is that we look at the use of time differently now. Uh, whereas we might have been counting minutes for our IB higher level classes and making sure we got it. I think we realize that things can be done in different time frames. And, uh, you know, I think we're building this schedule now, so it's still in progress, but I think we've all learned that we can look at our use of time differently and I think we've got more in our toolbox to, to, to work with kids on. Uh, that's one thing our teachers were so, they just were so, they persevered through very, very difficult times and they just kept thinking, well, what is it gonna take for me to reach this kid or how am I gonna do this differently? And they did it for the entire time and I think that that will continue as what can we do differently and how can we use time differently? That's awesome. Gentlemen, anything else you want to share here at the end? Something we didn't talk about? 
No, it, I think uh, it's been interesting watching the, the series a little bit, uh, getting ready for this, but it's been such a journey for our community and I'm sure for many others. And um, in some ways it's been overwhelming, but I'm also, I think we're all excited for how we can continue to look at how uh, this might help us transform some experiences to, to better meet the needs of kids in the future as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll be tuning in for the, the sessions about what happens next in August, right? So. <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Mark and Blair, thank you so much for your time. International School of Tanzania, it's fantastic. Uh, thanks for uh, being with us today. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. Thanks, Scott.